to Toyota Time with Timmy the Tool Man and Sean. Today, what we're gonna do is we're gonna upgrade the radiator on my 98 Toyota 4Runner. My 98 is heavily modified. I have aftermarket bumpers on it. I have a full belly of skid plates from the front all the way to the back, even a gas tank skid and a rear differential skid. I also have a roof rack that's made out of steel. It's kind of like a Gobi copy and it's pretty heavy. What I noticed after doing all the modifications, I noticed on the first drive I did it in hot ambient temperatures. I went down south to visit my buddy Anwar and in LA it was really hot at that time. It was about 110 degrees and I noticed on some climbs on the highway, my engine temperatures were going up pretty damn high and that was not what I experienced before all the modifications. I believe my temperature is going higher than normal is because of two main things. Number one, the aftermarket bumper and the winch I installed and aftermarket lighting and transmission coolers, they've all limited the amount of air that's coming through the cooling fins of the radiator. So it's hindering the cooling capacity of the stock radiator. And then the other thing that's affecting my engine temps is the fact that my rig is way, way heavier than stock. I'm constantly carrying around a lot of extra weight. Because of the bumpers, the winch, all the skid plates on the bottom, the heavy roof rack, etc. So my rig is way heavier than stock. So the engine is struggling all the time and especially when it hits the hills. So for the most part, my truck doesn't overheat if the ambient temps are below 90 degrees. But once they creep above 90 degrees and I'm driving on the highway with some hills or I'm just loaded down with a bunch of gear, I notice my engine temps start to go up pretty high and then I have to start using some techniques to keep the engine temp down, like turning the AC off when you really don't want to turn it off because it's hot and then actually running the heat to pull heat away from the engine and direct it somewhere else out the heating vents. Before I go through some more drastic measures like drilling holes on my bumper to get better airflow and taking some weight off my truck, like maybe getting rid of that heavy roof rack and going with something a lot lighter like a Sherpa roof rack, I'm gonna try changing out my OEM radiator with an aluminum radiator from Koyo. It's this big, beautiful thing right here. This radiator is supposed to have better flow characteristics. It's supposed to direct the coolant through three different channels as opposed to one channel. And it also has a higher capacity than the OEM one. So it should provide me with some better cooling. The question is, how much better is it going to be? This thing cost me around $400 which included a uh, different radiator cap. You can't use the same radiator cap you have on your OEM radiator. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna show you how to take out the OEM radiator and swap this one in. This is supposed to be a direct fit. There shouldn't be any modifications needed. It should bolt up exactly like the OEM. I'm hoping to see that that's the case and we don't have to do any drilling or grinding or anything of that nature. It's supposed to be a direct fit. One caveat for this Koyo radiator is it's made just for manual transmission. It doesn't have a transmission cooler in it. So I'll flip it around so you can see that. And you can see there's no cooler nipples to hook up your transmission cooler lines. This is not a big thing for me because I already decided to bypass my stock cooler so I have a standalone Hayden transmission cooler on my truck now. I'm not using the transmission cooler at the bottom of the OEM radiator. One thing you have to know if you're gonna follow my lead and do this on your third gen foreigner and you have an automatic transmission, you are gonna to have to do a standalone transmission cooler. And we have a video for that. If you click on the link above, you can see that video of me installing a Hayden cooler on my 98 Foreigner. So before we get started with the job of pulling out the old radiator and putting in this new Koyo one, I wanna do a comparison of my heavily modified 98 Forerunner front end and compare it to my stock 2000 front end and you can see how 
adding the aftermarket bumper, adding the winch, lighting, and that sort of thing, it dramatically cuts down the amount of air that can reach the radiator and help cool your engine. So let's get out to the rigs and do a comparison. So here's the front end of my stock 2004 runner. You have two main areas where air flows through to get to the radiator. You have the grill at the top, and you can see this is not encumbered with anything blocking airflow, and the air can go right through and reach the radiator. The other main pathway, and this is gonna be the biggest difference between a stock setup and an aftermarket setup with a big steel bumper is I also have really good airflow coming in through this bottom part of the bumper. The one thing that's hindering some airflow is the front license plate, but by law in California, you're supposed to have a front license plate. But if I took this front license plate off, I would have even better airflow to cool my engine. Now let's go over to my 98 Forerunner and let's see how that compares to the stock setup. So here's the front end of my 98 Forerunner. For the most part in the grill area, there really isn't too much hindering airflow in comparison to my 2000 other than my Warren Winch control box. This is clearly blocking some airflow. For the most part, air is still able to get into the upper part of the radiator cooling fins. I do have my large Hayden transmission cooler here and that could be blocking a little bit of airflow getting to the radiator because the air coming in the front end when I'm driving has to first go through that cooler and then the AC condenser and then finally the radiator. So that big transmission cooler, even though it's helping me with my transmission temps, could be hurting my engine coolant temps. So that's a little bit of an obstruction right there. Now when you go down lower, this is where the biggest difference is. This CBI bumper blocks a lot of air. I have the fair lead for my Ward winch that's blocking most of the air coming through here. I have two small holes here that do allow air to come through, but the rest of this is all blocked. It's solid steel. If the radiator doesn't work to reduce my coolant temps as much as I'd like, I might drill some extra holes like right here on either side of the license plate to get a little bit better airflow to the radiator. But that's gonna be kind of a last resort. I don't wanna be drilling into the bumper if I don't have to. Another thing that Sean and I did recently is we put aftermarket ox beam lights on our trucks. You can see a couple of them in the bumper here. I got one in each of these cutouts right here. That's not really affecting air getting to the radiator, but this big sucker was. On a recent trip we did for Sean's bachelor party, this sucker was right here. My truck was overheating pretty bad on the trip. We had some temperatures in the high 90s to 100, and I had to turn the heat on and do all those other things to keep my engine temp down. So I decided to just take this light off the front of my truck because Unless I'm going wheeling at nighttime, I really don't need to have it there blocking air getting to my radiator. So I'm just gonna have this in the back of my truck and if there's a time when I'm gonna be night wheeling, I'll just quickly bolt it on and plug it in and use it. And I don't suspect I'm gonna be overheating at night going wheeling, that's not gonna be an issue. I don't know if a lot of you other guys that have aftermarket setups like me, you have a lot of aftermarket accessories in the front, a big steel bumper, you have a winch, aftermarket lighting, and your truck is pretty heavy because you've added a lot of armor, and you're also experiencing some overheating issues when the ambient temps get above 90 degrees and you're climbing hills and you're loaded down with gear on a trip. So I pretty much think I can't be the only one experiencing this, and I've already done some stuff for my cooling system. When I bought the truck, before I started modifying it, I did replace the radiator, I replaced the fan clutch, I put a lower temp thermostat. Instead of using the OEM thermostat, I went with a Stant 170 degree thermostat so it opens up sooner than the OEM one and it didn't really help out. I think it helps out a little bit, but it doesn't really help out as much as you think running that lower temperature thermostat. So putting in the coil radiator is kind of my last attempt before I start doing some more drastic things like cutting holes on my bumper and getting rid of the steel roof rack, which I really like. 
but if my rig is just too heavy for my engine to handle, then I'm gonna have to start thinking of ways to take weight off it so it performs a little bit better and hotter temps. With all that said, let's get started with pulling out the old radiator and getting the coil one in. The first thing you're gonna to wanna to do is get your skid plate out of the way. And I already got my CBI skid plate out of the way and we decided not to show up because not many people are gonna have the same skid plate as me. So whatever skid plate you have, get the front skid plate off so you can access the drain and the lower radiator hose for this job. So the drain is right here. I'm gonna open it up and start the process of draining. To expedite the draining, I'm gonna get some air flowing and I'm gonna take the radiator cap to do that. While the radiator is draining, I'm gonna get the grill off. The grill is held on to the body with seven clips, four on the top and three on the bottom. And the best way to release them is with the flat blade screwdriver. You come in from the side, on the ones on the top at least, and you push down the little tab and then you pull back a little bit. And once you get several of them going, you'll get a little bit of movement. I already got some movement. When we get the grill off, we'll show you a better look at what these tabs look like. The ones on the bottom on either far side, you come in straight with the screwdriver and push it down and pull back a little bit. And we got another one over here. And same for the one in the center on the bottom. You could come in from the front with your screwdriver to release it. Once you get the grill off, you'll want to remove the clips and put them back into the grill. So to get these out, you just twist it right or left and you can get it out. After you get the clip out, you'll want to just put it right back in and snap it in, just like that. When you're ready to get the grill back in, it's a lot easier to snap it in with the clips inside the grill rather than the clips inside the body. So that's why we're doing that. As part of this job, I want to renew as much of the coolant as possible, which includes what's in the reservoir. So to get the reservoir out, I'm going to have to take the battery strap out of the way. This is a 12 millimeter bolt. This is J hooked in there. You can see the J hook and it slips into a slot in the body. So I'll just set this out of the way, put this bolt back in here. You'll probably have an easier time pulling this sucker up with the battery out of the way, but I'm gonna see if I can get enough leverage with my left hand underneath. The way this locks into the body, there's a metal bracket that slides into the reservoir. So you have to pull up with a decent amount of force. I don't know if I'm gonna get it. I think I am gonna pull the battery up. So I couldn't get the required leverage to get that reservoir out with the battery in the way. So I'm gonna take the battery out, 10 millimeter, Disconnect the negative first, and then disconnect the positive. I'm gonna lift this sucker out of the way. Now with the battery out, I should be able to get my hand in there better. But as you can see, I have a lot of accessory wiring here that's gonna hinder me a little bit. There we go. And I'll just pour what's in here into my drain container. So you can see the area where the body bracket slides into the reservoir and locks in place. We're gonna get the shroud out of the way and the shroud is two pieces. It has a bottom section and then it has the main top section. So you don't have to remove the fan clutch or anything to get the fan shroud out because of the fact it's two pieces. You remove the lower ring first. It's held on with a clip on either side so you pull outward on the clip and then slide it out, just like that. And then I'm gonna do the same on the one on the passenger side. The bottom ring of the fan shroud plugs into a few clips on the bottom and you just have to pull them out and then you can free the whole thing. You can feed this up to your friend. Before we can remove the upper part of the shroud, we have to get the upper radiator hose out of the way. I'm gonna use some 90 degree needle nose pliers, compress the clamp and move it back on the hose. Give it a twist here. It's been on there for a while. I think I'm gonna to have to use a hose pick tool to break that free. I'm gonna reuse this radiator hose so I have to be careful not to pierce it. So I'm just getting it in between the rubber of the hose and the plastic of the radiator. 
and working it around. Okay, that should have broke it free enough. There we go. The fan shroud is held to the body with four 10 millimeter bolts, two on each side. I'm on the driver's side right now. I'm using my Milwaukee gun and a deep 10 millimeter socket. It'll get the top one. This lower one is obscured by my transmission cooler hoses. So I'm gonna have to kind of go underneath it to get to that bolt. I actually have better access to seeing the socket get onto the bolt, so I'm doing it from underneath. This bottom one on the passenger side, I think I'm gonna try to go from underneath also. I think I'll have an easier time getting to it. One last thing I should do is just get this overflow tube out of the way. And then now I should just be able to lift this straight up. And there it is. And then remember what I was saying that the lower ring was hooked in? It hooks into these spots right here. So when you're looking from underneath, this is where you have to disconnect that lower shroud ring to completely free it. The draining of the coolant out of the petcock valve kind of came down to a trickle. A little more than five and a half quarts came out, but I know there's still coolant in the system. So I'm gonna now remove the lower radiator hose. And when I break it free of the nipple of the radiator and pull it off the nipple, there's gonna be coolant coming out and it could get a little messy. So just know that. So compress the constant tension clamp and move it back on the hose. We'll give it a twist and see if I could break it free. Oh, yep, yeah, it's gonna come free. Now I'm gonna try to get out of the path of the coolant because I know I'm gonna probably make a mess. Oh, not bad, not too bad. All right, we're gonna let that drain a little bit more and now we're gonna work on disconnecting the four bolts that hold the radiator to the body. I'm gonna point out where the four bolts are that hold the radiator to the body. This is the driver's side. There's one up top right here. And then you can see I have my Hayden cooler here. And then there's another one down here that is obscured partially by the cooler and all this accessory wiring that I have in the way so you can't really see it. But if you don't have all this other accessory crap like I do, you'll be able to see that bolt down there. Then coming over to the passenger side, you have one up top that's really easy to see. And then the one down below is a little bit obscured by the air conditioning receiver dryer, but it's right down there. Those bolts are a 12 millimeter and I'm gonna zip them out with my Milwaukee ratchet. If you don't have a system like me where you've already bypassed the stock transmission cooler in the bottom of the radiator, you're gonna to have to remove the two cooler hoses off the nipples of the bottom of the radiator. They're held on with a small constant tension clamp and then you might have to fight a little bit to get the rubber hose off the nipple. And if that is the case, then a good technique to breaking them free is a little pick tool or you can use some hose pliers and we'll put links in the video description of both of those. The radiator hooks into the body with a couple hooks on either side. So you have to pull up and free the hooks and then you can pull the radiator straight out. It's fighting me over here. All those cooler hoses I have in there are fighting me. I joined the two nipples on the bottom with a rubber hose and those are hanging me up. This hose is hooking me. So I got it past that one. Maybe I can get it now. There we go. You could see what was hanging me up. I joined the cooler nipple so nothing could get in there and no leftover transmission fluid could leak out. And this hose was hooking the blades of the fan. So now I finally got it free. All right, we're gonna drop this one in and cross our fingers and hope what they advertise is correct, that all the bolt holes are gonna line up perfectly and we're not gonna have to do any alterations to make it work. Okay, it's in there. Let's see how the bolt holes line up. The top one looks really good. And this top one over here looks pretty good. So I think maybe we're gonna be okay. I was able to get all four 12 millimeter bolts started with no problem. So Koyo did stand up to their statement that it is a direct fit. The torque value for these bolts is like nine foot pounds, but I'm just gonna go by feel Use that German spec we all know and love. Good and tight. Just getting good and tight. Good and tight. 
Now that I have the radiator properly secured to the body, I'm going to reconnect the lower radiator hose. Just make sure you get maximum insertion. Got to bottom out on it and then get my needle nose pliers and move the constant tension clamp over the nipple. And there it is. It looks like the nipple on the aluminum radiator is a little bit thicker. So it was a little bit more of a chore to get the constant tension clamp slid over, but I got it. Now I'm gonna get the upper shroud in place. And this will be another thing to note if the bolt holes for the shroud all line up nice with this aftermarket Koyo. I'm tightening the 10 millimeter bolts for the shroud with my quarter inch ratchet short extension and a 10 millimeter socket. I'm just going by feel and snugging them up. So we've got the upper shroud connected with the four 10 millimeter bolts. Now I'm gonna slide in the lower ring and get that connected to the upper shroud. So I have to slide this sucker underneath, try to get one side started here on the driver's side and then probably go underneath and get the other side started. I've got the lower piece of the fan shroud reconnected with the two metal clips. And now I'm gonna reconnect the upper radiator hose. Okay, that's reconnected. Now I'm gonna get the reservoir back in and then after that, the battery. We'll just snap this in. Remember, it's got to slide over this bracket. I'll get the tube in there and then hook up the hose. Boom, goes the dynamite. If your reservoir was really dirty with a bunch of gunk in it, you could rinse it out with some water. Mine was pretty clean, so I didn't need to rinse it out. Okay, I'm gonna drop the battery back in like this gonna get my battery strap in place. I have to hook the J-hook into the body first. Fish that down there. I've got the J-hook hooked and now I'm gonna get the 12 millimeter bolt started. Strap this sucker down. So the total we got out of the cooling system is somewhere a little bit more than six and a half quarts. If I was able to get out a total of eight quarts then it'd be a little bit easier to fill it because all I would do would be to add a full gallon of concentrate and then a full gallon of distilled water and I'd be really close to topping off the system. But because I didn't get quite that amount out, I'm gonna mix a 50-50 mix in a gallon container and I'll show you that right now. So what I'll do is I'll pour in two quarts of concentrate, then two quarts of distilled water to make a 50-50 mix and then I'll pour that in and then I'll make another gallon knowing that i'll probably use most of it because i still have to top off the reservoir if i have a little extra i have a little extra so this is how i'm going to mix it at first i want to use my lyle spill free funnel to fill up the radiator but we're noticing a fitment issue in regards to the coil radiator this adapter normally works for oem radiators you fit it on there and then you get this small cap on well, this small cap doesn't fit the Koyo radiator. So you have to go to the next size bigger cap. But then when you put that on there, it's a total loose fit. So Sean came up with a good idea. We took a fat washer off of another one of the bigger adapters. We slide it over the top of it and then put the bigger cap on and it seems to work to get a tighter fit. See, that's a lot better. So now we just get our spill-free funnel in there and then we start filling it up. One thing I forgot to mention is you wanna make sure that the drain is tight. And what I notice is that drain isn't like a hand nipple. You have to tighten it with the wrench and the size wrench is a 14 millimeter. So I cinch that sucker up snug. The radiator stopped taking coolant, so now it's time to start it. After I start the engine, I'm gonna wanna turn the heater control valve all the way to the hot position. That opens up the heater control valve on the firewall, and then that will let the coolant flow through the heater hoses and the heater core to properly burp the system. And if you have a rear heater, you're also gonna wanna turn those controls fully hot so the coolant will flow through the rear heater too. So here we go. So I'll turn this on 
all the way. You don't have to have the fan on. You just want the heater control all the way to the hot position. Now I'm gonna go to the back and do the same. It's gonna flip this all the way to the hot. You're gonna see bubbles coming up and that's air working its way out. We burped the cooling system and because the adapter didn't work so well with the aluminum coil radiator, filling it didn't work out as well. A lot of the coolant was directing into the overflow reservoir, which I never see on an OEM setup. So that was a little janky, but it is what it is. One thing that I forgot to mention to facilitate the burping of the system is you want the radiator at the highest point of your cooling system. So that means you want the front end higher than the rear end. And because I have a sloping driveway at my house, it works out perfect to do it in my driveway. Once you stop seeing significant bubbles come up and the bubbles pretty much stop, then you take your funnel out and then you put your cap on. You're most likely gonna see the level in your reservoir drop a little bit. And that's because air is still working its way out of the system. I've seen it almost every time I've done a drain of a cooling system. Air is gonna slowly still work its way out and you're gonna notice it drop. But I have my reservoir filled to the full mark and then I'm gonna keep looking at it over the next week. And then if it drops a little bit, I'm just gonna top it off to the full level, provided I'm at operating temperature. If the engine was cold, then you'd wanna see the level in your reservoir at the cold level. So it depends at what temperature you're checking the level as to what line you fill it to in the reservoir. So now I'm gonna get my grill back in. There it is. All right, we're all done with this job. Replacing a radiator on one of these vehicles is pretty straightforward. It would be the same process if you had a first gen Tacoma. They have the same engines, same front end pretty much. So if you found this video, then hopefully it helped you with your first gen Tacoma. Time is gonna tell whether replacing my radiator with the aluminum coil radiator had any real positive effect on my engine temps. I'm gonna need to drive it in hot temps, load it down with gear, and see how it compares to the past. Hopefully, my temperatures are gonna be better, but it's gonna take time for me to figure that out. What I'll do is I'll add a pinned comment, that will be the first comment you see, and I'll give updates. So as I take trips in hot temps, I will report what I found, and hopefully I'm gonna be reporting that my engine temps are much better than they were. But if they're not, then I'll also report that too because I don't want anybody following my lead and spending $400 on a radiator and radiator cap when it's not gonna really benefit you. So if you don't see a pinned comment yet, that means you caught the video before I had a chance to really test this system out. So I would advise don't go ahead and buy it until I can give you a report whether it is having a positive effect on my coolant temps or no, it's really not doing anything for me. And the OEM radiator is just as good as the Koya. So stay tuned and hopefully I'll be reporting some good news. With all that said, we thank you for watching Toyota Time with Timmy the Tool Man and Sean. We will of course be back with more videos. If you haven't subscribed yet, hit that subscribe button. If you wanna be notified when we put up new content, click on the notification bell. Peace out, happy wrenching, sick mods, and sick aluminum radiators from Koyo. Bye-bye.